but we all appreciate that you're here. And um, you should be here because this is a great lecture and yeah. So <laughs> um, I want to introduce our lecturer for tonight and um, just give you a little background information on where he's studying and stuff. So <laughs> his, um, he got his bachelor's degree in Semitic languages at the University of Sydney. He earned his master's in Eastern Christianity at the University of Leiden. And uh, he received his PhD in Assyrian Syriac Studies from the University of Melbourne. And um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nicholas L. to the stage. Now I'm not sure exactly what, what should I what I should do. Should I clip this to me? Yeah. Maybe I should. Can everybody hear me? Matuda al Tajir to a son. Yes. Yes. Can everybody hear me clearly? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I would really, uh, it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here with you this evening. I'd really like to thank first and foremost the Assyrian American uh, Association of Southern California for bringing me here to LA. I was actually meant to be in Australia right now, but they brought me over and said for me to delay my flight back home to give this lecture here today, which is, which is an honor for me. I'd like to thank the History Department at UCLA, and also the Assyrian American National Federation, which had originally brought me out to do a couple of lectures here in the United States. So, my talk today is about Assyrian continuity. Now, uh, if you look in the history books, there really isn't much about the Assyrians after the fall of the Assyrian Empire. And people just take it for granted, whether they be scholars or historians, uh, take it for granted that the Assyrians became extinct, that there were no longer any people that continued any form of Assyrian identity or uh, identified with that empire or that region in the world. Now, uh, what I will be presenting today is uh, goes counter to that, and it's based on a group of people known as the modern Assyrians. So currently a stateless and transnational ethnic group. There is, there is still a group of uh, people that call themselves Assyrians, that identify as Assyrians, and they still inhabit areas of northern Mesopotamia in countries such as Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and Iran. When we look at the literary traditions of these people, uh, they are rife with allusions to ancient Mesopotamian culture, and specifically to Assyria. Now, their Aramaic language, which they still speak today, is infused with many Akkadian words, and of course Akkadian was the language of the ancient Assyrian and Babylonian empires. And also, I'm going to show that many of the modern Assyrian settlements are millennia old and are built beside archaeological mounds and other um, archaeological sites. So first I'm going to deal with the survival of the geographical term Assyria as a reality after the fall of the Assyrian Empire. Now, many people are met with sarcasm or met with disbelief when they tell somebody that they're Assyrian. And the first thing that someone would say is, well, are you from Syria? And then the person would have to explain why they're not from Syria and what Syria means and what Syria means. Um, and one of the main issues that scholars have with Assyrians identifying as Assyrians is, well, you can't be Assyrians, they say, because there has been no Assyria for 2,600 years. Now, sure, Assyria may have not been a state for 2,600 years, but it certainly was a geographical area which uh, is well known in many sources, I'm going to be showing that. 
So firstly, just to give you a rundown or a basic idea of where the area of Assyria or Assyria proper or the Assyrian heartland is located, uh, it's basically in the northern part of Iraq, that northeastern part of Syria, adjoining parts of southeastern Turkey as well as northwestern Iran just across the border. And here you can see many of the traditional uh, areas with Assyrian uh, majorities historically listed, such as Hakkari, Urmi, the, the, the Nineveh Plains, and Turabdi. And here is a map from a website that has recently come out called Assyrian Roots. Uh, this is actually a, a snapshot of an interactive map which uh, lists a lot of the Assyrian villages. It doesn't list all of them, there are many more, but this gives you some sort of an idea as to where Assyrian settlements and villages are located in this area. They're sort of grouped around the same area and they're contiguous with one another. So, we know from history that the Assyrian Empire uh, began to fall in 612 BC with the fall of Nineveh, <coughs> which was the imperial capital at the time. Uh, the fall of, this, of the final capital, Haran, in 609 BC. And we, we, stop, uh, we stop finding any written references to the former Assyrian Empire in roughly 605. We can assume that the Assyrian uh, imperial administration had been dismantled completely. Now what succeeded the ancient Assyrian Empire were two empires, the Neo-Babylonians or the Chaldeans and the Medes, and they divided the Assyrian heartland between themselves as you can see in this map here. Now these two empires ruled for roughly maybe 80 to 90 years, all up, and that period of roughly two to three generations was not enough time for the complete dismantling of Assyrian identity. So even though the local administration had been dismantled, the imperial administration had been dismantled, there would have still been people on the ground identifying as Assyrians within three generations. And this is proven in the administration of the empire that succeeded the Babylonians and the Medes. Uh, the Achaemenid Empire, or the first Persian Empire, actually had a satrapy, or a province, called Assyria, which in Persian is called Arthura. And in this map you can actually see where it was located. And <clears throat> this satrapy of Arthura existed for roughly 200 years. So, geographically, Within the Persian Empire, there was an area called Assyria, the inhabitants of whom were Assyrians. Now, within the Achaemenid satrapy of Arthura, the Assyrians were given the right to govern themselves. Aramaic, which was brought in as a, as a as the second official language of the Assyrian Empire in the 8th century BC, was uh, continued as a diplomatic language and as a language of trade by the Achaemenids. Uh, the Assyrian judici judicial system, calendar, and imperial standards were used by the Achaemenids, and Achaemenid art, as uh, we will see in a little bit, was highly influenced by the Assyrians, as well as the fact that the uh, Assyrian god Ashur was revived by the Persians as Ahura Mazda. Now, basically, the Assyrians continued to live under a very similar system of government, and it was as if for 200 years, almost nothing had changed. And that's how the system was in ancient Mesopotamia. Basically, city-states would take over other city-states, and they would see themselves as the successors of whoever preceded them. In this way, we see that the Achaemenids and those that came after them, such as the Parthians and the Sasanians, who I'll mention in a little bit, saw themselves as the continuation of the Assyrian Empire, and the Babylonians and the Assyrians, and even built their capitals around the former great capital of Babylon. Also, Assyrian soldiers constituted the main heavy infantry of the Persian military. Rural Assyria flourished, and this is mentioned by the Greek writer Xenophon around 401 BC, 
Assyrian cities became administrative centers. So Nineveh, Nimrud, uh, Ashur were all reoccupied and inhabited during this period. And interestingly, the Assyrians revolted twice within a hundred years of the fall of their empire. So the Assyrians actually revolted, and there are Persian records for this, in 546 and 520 BC in order to regain some sort of independence. So obviously, at this stage, the Assyrians had not been completely exterminated and there was an Assyrian identity. So here we can see um, at the top right an image of Abu Ramazda, which was basically a copy of the ancient Assyrian god Ashur, who, is also, uh, who also sits within a winged disc. To the bottom left you have the Lamassu, or the winged bulls, which were also borrowed, uh, borrowed from Assyrian, uh, the Assyrian artistic repertoire. And to the top left you have an image of Assyrians bearing tribute to the Persian emperor, which I'm going to discuss in a, in a little bit. So even within textual information, and I'd like to actually thank my friend Mark, uh, Mark Uergis from Sydney for helping me with these slides. Um, there are Persian texts from after the fall of the Assyrian Empire which mention Assyrians as a surviving, existing ethnic group. So in this one, Cyrus actually says that he gathered all the inhabitants of Assyria and returned them to their, to their dwellings, to their cities. From some other inscriptions, we see that the Assyrians had been transporting cedar beams for the Persian emperors, and many of them were even uh, used to work as artisans in the Persian, uh, in the palaces of the Persian emperors. Now, here you can see very clearly a relief from the eastern staircase of the Apadana, or the palace at Persepolis, uh, which clearly mentions the Ashurik, the Assyrians who were bearing tribute. And mind you, this is more than 100 years after the fall of the Assyrian Empire, nearly 200 years. So the Assyrians were still alive. They were just part of another administration. Again, uh, in this relief from uh, Nakhchirustan and the tomb of Persian Emperor Xerxes II, uh, in the 5th century, you see a whole array of peoples who are holding up the throne of the king, who are holding up the Persian Empire, and one of them is uh, an Arthuriya, an Assyrian. And he's actually outlined there, you can see there's a box around him. Now, with the fall of the Achaemenid Empire and the coming of Alexander the Great and the Hellenic, Hellenistic Empire, Assyria remained a part of that administration as, as a province, and we see that. Uh, under Alexander the Great for the time that he ruled. He only ruled that area for seven years. However, when he did pass away, his empire was divided between um, his generals. So the one general that took the area that the Assyrians, uh, that basically mimicked the uh, span of the Assyrian Empire was a general named Seleucus, and he started what later became known as the Seleucid Empire and they ruled for roughly 200 years. And the Seleucid Empire in texts is often known as the Assyrians. So we find, for example, in the Hanukkah story, in Jewish texts, in Hebrew, that these people, the Seleucids, are actually identified as Ashurim, as Assyrians. Because they were, well, because of their geographical extent, they were seen as the successors of the ancient Assyrian Empire. And of course in Greek sources of the time we also see them as the Syrian Empire. So at this time also, Syrian and Assyrian are synonymous with one another. Now after the Seleucid period and the coming of the Parthians, we find the development of small vassal states or client kingdoms that are wedged in between first the Roman Empire and the Parthians and then later on the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanids. And these three kingdoms were the kingdom of Osroene, 
which had its uh, capital at Edessa, which was not very far from the last Assyrian capital of Haran. There was also the kingdom of Adiabin, which had its capital at Erbil in northern Iraq, which was not very far from the main Assyrian imperial capital at Nineveh, and also Hatra, which you can see in the center there. Hatra was it's famous in the news because it was destroyed by ISIS last year. Uh, the kingdom of Araba, uh, which had its its capital at Hatra, was also not very far from the very first Assyrian capital city at Ashur. And here you can see the red is the Roman Empire, the brown is the Persian Empire, and these small client states are shaded in pink and, and orange. So some of them were vassal states of the Romans, some were vassal states of the Parthians. So I'm just going to focus a little bit on the kingdom of Adiabene, which existed roughly between 15 and 116 AD. And this was a vassal state at times of the Armenian kingdom, but also later on of the Parthian Empire and Sasanian Empire. It later became the Sasanian province of Nochirakan, and it, it retained its prestige even though its name had been changed uh, and it had lost its independence. Obviously, prior to that, it had its own royal family, but once it was subsumed into the Sasanian Empire, it became the domain of the crown prince of the Sasanian royal line. So every Sasanian crown prince would be labeled king of Nochiraka or king of Assyria prior to becoming emperor of Iran Shahar or the Sassanid Empire. Now the capital of Adiabay was the ancient Assyrian town of Arba Ilu, the city of the four gods, now today as Erbil. Its inhabitants were Assyrians. And during this time, we can see that the temple of Ashur, uh, at the first Assyrian capital city, was still in use, and I'm going to get to that in a little bit. And this time we also see that the royal family of, uh, of Adi Abin converted to Judaism. And later on, this helped with the spread of another monotheistic religion, which is more uh, closely identified with the modern Assyrians. Later on we see that Adi Abin or Arbil becomes a metropolitan see of the Church of the East with jurisdiction over historical Assyria. So, the city of Asur, which is south of Mosul or Nineveh, and just north of Baghdad, or even north of Tikrit, um, was rebuilt and was re-inhabited during the Parthian period, or during the period of the Kingdom of Adiabene. And there are inscriptions that have been discovered from there that can be dated between 12 and 238 AD. Okay. Now the image at the top shows one of the temples at Ashur which had been reconstructed. We know also that the Akitu temple had been reconstructed so that they were celebrating the Assyrian New Year there. Uh, and here you can see in this image, it's not very clear, but you can see an example of the Aramaic language that was being used in these inscriptions at the time. Now these inscriptions have shown us that the uh, ancient Assyrian religion was alive and well and that the ancient Assyrian gods were still being worshipped, among them Nabu, Nergal, Adad, Shamash, as well as the Assyrian Holy Trinity, or a group of gods which by that time had developed into a Holy Trinity, and seeing that, you know, afterwards the Assyrians became Christians, which in itself has its own Holy Trinity, it's a very interesting parallel. So, at Ashur, during this period, we find three gods that are worshipped as a trinity. Uh, we have Asur, who is the head of the Assyrian pantheon, who he is also known as Baal, as uh, Mar Alahe, so as the lord of the gods, uh, Maron, our lord, Rabbaita, the head of the house, Malka, the king, or even just simply Allah, God. There are even inscriptions uh, where without even referring to the god Asur, he is just called Allah, God. The second person in the Trinity was Ishtar, also known as Sherwa or Nanai, also known as Marta, the Lady, or Our Lady, Martan, 
uh, or Malikta, the queen. And Tammuz, <coughs> who was Bar Mare, or the son of our lords, also known as Bar Alaha, or the son of God. This is interesting because these terms get reused later on in Christianity. So in the inscriptions at Asura, and here's one example of it, we see that Asura is being worshipped as a deity, and this inscription is from roughly 200 to 215 AD. Okay? We see also that Ashur shows up as part of people's names. So Aqib Asur Akashama, which means Aqab Shamash. So uh, Shamash was the sun god. Now I would like to draw your attention to the fact that the name Ashur in this period had developed into Asur. It was no longer Ashur. So I'm going to just continue. Cultural continuity. So not only were the same gods being worshipped, not only was the Aramaic language still in use, but also in the iconography of the, um, of the reliefs that we find at Asur. So for example, to the left, uh, you have the stele of the Assyrian Emperor Adad Mirari III from 800 BC. To the right, you have the stele of the Maria, or the governor of Asur, whose name was Rahat Asur, who lived in 12 AD. Uh, you can see that, okay, the stance, the composition is almost exactly the same. The dress is a little bit different, I'll give it that. The hairstyles are different. Uh, maybe the, the language is different. The one on the left is in cuneiform, it's in Akkadian, but the one on the right is in Aramaic. But also notice the, the symbols, or the, the symbols of the gods around the heads of both. Uh, the one on the right is more, is more simple than the one on the left, but there are at least two symbols that are identical to the ones on the first. So there are roughly 800 years between these two, but it shows some sort of cultural continuity. The same gods were still being worshipped, the same language was still being spoken, and the same style of art was still being produced. Now, it is believed that the modern Assyrian identity, language, and culture developed during the preceding Seleucid period and was crystallized during the Parthian one. Indeed, the calendar and dating system used by the Assyrians throughout most of the Middle Ages called the, the Greek calendar or the Seleucid calendar began in 311 BC. Also the great Assyrian identity which developed from Assyria and the Syriac language, the first example of which dates to 6 AD, all come from this period. As well as, I would, I would argue, modern Assyrian costume which uncannily resembles that of Adi Bain and Hatra from the Parthian period. Now, in this image you can see, on the left, a relief from Asur. It is of one of the governors of Asur. He's, in, he's dressed in Parthian dress. Okay, it's a, a jacket and pants. On the right you have traditional Assyrian dress from the modern period. And it's almost exactly the same. On the right here, you have the statue of a princess or a priestess from the city of Hatra. And I think this was destroyed by ISIS last year. Notice her headdress. Notice the piece of fabric that's worn on top of her clothing. And then compare it on the left to a modern Assyrian woman from the village of Teleskov in the Nineveh Plain. And their dress is almost exactly the same. Now, here you can see another map of where these little client kingdoms were located. On the top left, you can see an image of the sarcophagus of Queen Helena of Adiabene, who converted to Judaism in the first century AD. To the right of that are transcriptions of the inscription which is on her sarcophagus. And for those that know how to read Syriac, they can clearly read Sadan Malikta in the Estrangelo script. And that was her name in 
her native language. And after doing some research, I found that Sadan is actually an Akkadian word. So it's a name that goes back centuries earlier to the Assyrian Empire. So again, we find that between 116 and 118 AD, that the Kingdom of Adiabin, or the area of Assyria, was incorporated within the Roman Empire as the province of Assyria. And later on, so roughly between 26 and 637 AD, for a period of nearly 600 years, or more than 600 years, that whole area is known as Asuristan. So first under the Parthians, then under the Sasanians. And Asuristan corresponded originally to Assyria and Babylonia, the whole of Mesopotamia. Now, Asuristan is a compound of two words. It's a compound of Asur, or Assyria, and the Iranian suffix Estan, meaning land of. So it meant land of Assyria. So, later on we find that the term Asuristan, as Assyria proper is renamed Nochirakan, gradually shifts to the area around southern Mesopotamia and that prestige area around the capital of the Parthian and Sasanian empires. So, we know from this time also that temples were still being dedicated to the ancient Assyrian deities or the ancient Assyrian gods, such as Ashur, Shamash, Ishtar, Sin, Hadad and Ninurta, in places such as Ashur, Erbil and Haran during the 3rd and 4th centuries AD, and that traces of the ancient Assyrian religion would survive into the 10th century in remote parts of Assyria, as well as the fact that the Assyrian New Year festival continued to be cele celebrated in areas with large Assyrian concentrations, such as the Turaktin Plateau and the current highlands. So just to give you an idea of the location of Asuristan, it was right in the center of the uh, Sassanid Empire, and the, the Sassanids actually called it Dere Iran Shah, or the heart of the Iranian homeland. And here you can see that again. And I think the reason of, the reason for the Sasanians naming the area around their capital, Asuristan, must have been linked to the fact that they still perceived the Assyrian Empire as the greatest empire to have ever existed before them in that area. And I'm sure that a lot of them would have wanted to emulate the ancient Assyrians in uh, their governorship of the area. And here you can see all that remains of the Persian capital or of the Sassanid capital it's a, site, it's a site that still stands today. It's the Arch of Khosro at the Ktesaphon or Salman Pak in Iraq. Now on this slide, you can see some images from Osroene or Edessa. I mentioned that to the, until the third or fourth century, the ancient gods were still being worshiped in Northern Mesopotamia. Uh, here you can see a mosaic with a Syriac inscription from the area of Edessa and the name Barsamia and an image of the, uh, of the king, the local king, whose name was Abgar and around that mosaic are images of temples and cult areas from the site of Sogmata, which is just to the east of Edessa and these were all pagan cult places uh, dedicated to pagan gods with Assyrian names and if you look, I actually have better quality uh, images for those that are interested. If you look closely at the inscriptions on these, they're all in Syriac. And they're all in the Estrangelo script of Syriac. So this is before the Syriac language became so closely associated with being Christian. Excuse me, what do you mean by Syriac? Classical Syriac. Lishanati. Lishanati. And these are recent images. These are recent images of mosaics and carvings from the 3rd, 4th, 5th century AD. Excuse me, what is that circle? Which one? The one down there. The lower right. This is a temple. Oh, that's... This is a temple. And they, these are both temples. These are all sort of cultic areas. Areas where um, ancient pagan deities were worshipped. So, shifting on from the Middle East, 
when we look at sources from outside of the Middle East, so Greek sources, Roman sources, we find that the area is still being identified by them as Assyria. So, for example, <coughs> Hecateus, who lived in the uh, sixth, fifth and sixth centuries BC, uh, in Herodotus, who lived in the fifth century BC, they still call that area Assyria. Herodotus actually says that this people whom the Hellenes call Syrians are called Assyrians by the barbarians. So it starts from the time of Herodotus that the names Syrian and Assyrian are uh, 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 synonyms of one another. Assyria is again mentioned by er Eratosthenes in the 2nd 3rd century BC. In Strabo, in the 1st century BC, 1st century AD, and I'm going to come back to Strabo. Uh, it's mentioned by Pomponius Mela in the 1st century AD, mm -hmm. and by Ptolemy in the 1st, 2nd century AD, not BC, that's a typo. Um, and obviously the uh, cosmography or the geographical works of Ptolemy were copied throughout the Middle Ages. So even though the work was um, first composed in the first, second century AD, these maps with Assyria in them were being copied until the 1500s or 1600s. Even until the th uh, maybe the third century or the fourth century AD, we find Justinus, who talks about the Assyrians, who were afterwards called the Syrians, and who held their empire for 1,300 years. Back to Strabo. Now, Strabo lists several of the traditional cities uh, within the Assyrian heartland, among them uh, Nineveh, which he calls Ninos, and Kalachene, or Kalfu, uh, or Nimrod, which is known as Nimrod today, and he calls the Assyrian heartland Arturia, okay? Very similar to Artur. Now, he writes that when those who have written histories about the Syrian Empire say that the Medes were overthrown by the Persians and the Syrians by the Medes, they mean by the Syrians no other than those who built the royal palaces in Babylon and Nineveh. And of these Syrians, Ninus was the man who founded Nineveh in Arturia. And his wife, Semiramis, was the woman who succeeded her husband, etc. So obviously, during this time, there was no concept of Levantine Syria. Syria just meant Assyria. Now, with the coming of Christianity in, and the strengthening of Christianity in the 3rd century, I would say 4th century AD, and the spread of the Church of the East, Assyria remained as the name of an ecclesiastical province. You can see here, for example, Arthur, Assyria, um, and a major metropolitan archdiocese of the church, which lasted from roughly 410 AD until 1813. Now, according to Patricia Crone, author of Hagarism, Christianity in Assyria was a way of sanctifying a provincial identity, and she calls the local 